Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Jones. Uh, I work for the Chandler Police Department, and I am also a threat liaison officer for the state of Arizona. And today we will be talking about Wi-Fi hacking. And um, so a little bit about myself. I have a master's degree in intelligence analysis from the American Military University. I have um, a specialization in cybersecurity. Uh, in addition to that, I have helped found our Phoenix Linux Users Group Cybersecurity Meetup. And I have been working with computers for a very long time. And um, I am very happy to be here. So if you all have any questions or anything that you want to ask me, feel free to do so. Uh, tonight is going to be not as long as normal, but uh, I still think that there's plenty of information in here that will be uh, worthwhile to each of you. So we'll be talking about our introduction to Wi-Fi hacking. Uh, our performance objectives will include identifying at least one site that can assist you in locating wireless networks. We're going to identify at least one tool used to crack wireless networks. We're going to identify what frequencies Wi-Fi functions on, and we're going to talk in detail about uh, some of the information that goes along with Wi-Fi. And then we're going to identify a tool for phishing Wi-Fi passwords, which um, is probably one of the more effective methods for being able to get people's information whenever you are out and about. So what does Wi-Fi actually stand for? Uh, I went ahead and I went around and I looked to see if I could find out what Wi-Fi stood for. And there was actually several different um, definitions that I located, which I thought was very interesting. But the one that I felt was probably the most canonical is wireless fidelity. So Wi-Fi or wireless fidelity is what we're going to go ahead and use here. Uh, if you disagree with me, totally understand, because depending on what web page you go to, uh, they will give you different answers. So. Wi-Fi is very interesting in that it works within the 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz range. Now, if you deal with drones, uh, you probably also know that with drones comes certain um, packages that don't necessarily work uh, on 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. Uh, totally understand it is still technically Wi-Fi, uh, but uh, we're not going to include that tonight. That's not going to be exactly our discussion. But uh, if you are using tools like uh, GNU Radio, uh, you can still use those tools in order to take a look at some of the stuff that is going on around you, uh, even related to uh, drones. So Wi-Fi should theoretically not be able to interfere with cell phones, broadcast radio, television, or handheld radios. Uh, we will find out very quickly that that is not necessarily the case. In addition to that, if you have a microwave oven in your house, uh, you should think very long and hard about making sure that your microwave oven is nowhere near your uh, Wi-Fi system. Because while theoretically they should not be able to stomp all over each other, uh, we will find out that that is not necessarily the case. So what are we using Wi-Fi for? Well, Wi-Fi is used for several different purposes. Uh, generally, most of us who are familiar with Wi-Fi will know that Wi-Fi is used for things like connecting to computers, uh, being able to communicate over long distances. But in addition to that, you're going to find that uh, Wi-Fi is being used for very long distance communication. Um, there are uh, cell phones that are being used to communicate. In addition to that, we also have to deal with all of the other stuff that is, happen wire that is happening wirelessly around us, which can include things like Bluetooth and, uh, again, some of the proprietary stuff that is being used by drones and all these other signals that are happening all around us. Sorry, I'm moving around a little too much. So is Wi-Fi more or less secure than a traditional wired network? Neither. So Wi-Fi is going to be um, completely different 
and a little bit less comparable in terms of interfaces. However, many of the things that you need to worry about or be concerned with have some sort of application between the two. So just because you're using a Wi-Fi uh, connection does not necessarily mean that you are more or less secure. It just means that the avenues of attack and the methods by which somebody could potentially uh, attack you are different. Because oftentimes people will um, get up and say, well, what we've done is we don't allow any Wi-Fi uh, connectivity in an area, and that by removing the ability to provide Wi-Fi, therefore we are much more secure. And what I want everybody to understand and to think about is the fact that just because you have or do not have Wi-Fi does not necessarily mean that that system is more or less secure. Uh, case in point, if we're thinking about something like Stuxnet, right? Uh, Stuxnet was used to attack what was supposed to be an air-gapped network. And if you're not familiar with the term air-gapped, uh, air-gapped means simply that that network should theoretically have no connection out into the outside world over the internet. So if there's no connection over the internet, theoretically from the outside looking in, I should not be able to attack that network. However, what was discovered was that's not the case. There are still methods by which you can deliver a payload uh, even if that network is not necessarily connected to the internet. So for somebody to sit down and think to themselves, well, if our network is not connected to the internet, therefore uh, I am more secure, you are really doing yourself a disservice. Same thing with Wi-Fi, same thing with any other tool that you might happen to be using. We have to think about it as being different, not better or worse. So uh, if we are dealing with wireless devices, that does mean, however, that security, availability, and functionality are going to be different. So what do we need? look at? Well, we need to think about the fact that potentially somebody outside in our parking lot can very easily uh, cause a disruption within our building, uh, but if we have devices that are located on a wireless network. Now, could they do the exact same thing if your network is hardwired? Well, potentially, uh, a potential avenue of attack would be um, seeding your parking lot with flash drives. So hoping that somebody would pick up that flash drive and then enter into your place of business, plug that into a computer, and then the exact type of access that they were hoping to gain, they have then done so just by using a completely different methodology, which would be getting a human to conduct that attack for them. Uh, I do want to make a point of this, though, before we move forward. Uh, Wi-Fi does not make you sick. Okay, um, there are actually people online that I noticed while I was doing research here who have created reports that say things like Wi-Fi causes autism, uh, Wi-Fi will make you sick, that you can be allergic to Wi-Fi. Uh, there is a test that was conducted in which they took baby toys, like little blocks, and they taped them to people's heads and then they told them that those baby toys were actually Wi-Fi transmitters. And as soon as they told people that those baby toys were Wi-Fi transmitters, they began to suffer from things like headaches. Uh, they suffered from things like dizziness. Uh, they felt ill. Um, there was a laundry list of things that happened to people as soon as they began thinking that uh, a Wi-Fi transmitter was very close to their head. However, um, what they found was that as long as somebody believed that they were going to get sick, they were able to make them sick. But as long as that person uh, essentially didn't think that they were going to become sick, nothing happened to them. So what I would say from this is if you're concerned or worried about having um, a wireless signal within your home, you need to understand there are so many wireless signals surrounding you that uh, having something like a Wi-Fi device, a router or something similar in your home is not going to make you sick. And I bring this up because when you start looking into Wi-Fi security, uh, there are literally people on there who are saying things like, I need to learn how to break into Wi-Fi routers so that I can turn them off in order to protect myself. Uh, I don't want to get sick. Uh, comments like that online, so I thought I would address that very quickly.
I see a bunch of like, what? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Um, well, so, all right, okay, so with the, uh, with the security for the physical versus wireless options, okay. um, in relation to, you're saying that there are just different methods that you'd go about getting into it. Uh-huh. Um, but if we're, so the debate would be between a wired or wireless network though, right? So are you asking like, so you're going back to the idea of is a wireless or wireless, is a wired or wireless network more or less secure, right? So it's different because potentially uh, I have to make a decision on how I am going to access your systems, right? If I'm, a, if I'm an attacker, whatever you are using is going to dictate my behavior, okay? So let's go back to what's the most effective way of getting into somebody's computer. The most effective way to get into somebody's computer is to ask. It's to just pick up the phone and tell them, hey, hey, this is Aaron. Uh, I'm just giving you a call because I work upstairs in your IT department. Uh, I work with list of people that I have found on LinkedIn. Um, they're not in the office right now. They've asked me to give you a call. All I need you to do is, uh, I'm going to send you over a link. I just need you to click on that link. We're just doing some testing internally. And then you go, okay. And so I send you over a link. You click on it. I have access remotely to your system, right? That's like the simplest method, and it doesn't really require any kind of um, hardcore like spy craft or anything like that. It's, it's, I ask. You give it to me. We're done. Um, cost is another item. Uh, if I have to go out and I have to buy a bunch of tools and Wi-Fi sniffer and uh, you know a specific Wi-Fi card and all that other stuff, that's different than maybe using a flash drive that cost me eight bucks at the dollar store or something. Um, it's regardless of what method that you're going to use to try to attack somebody's system, we have to be full spectrum on defense. But you as an attacker, you can get very pinpointed and very targeted. So therefore, to me, regardless of which decision you make, I still need to be concerned about security. And I can't treat my network as any different than whether it's wired or wireless. I still have to be full spectrum. Because I also want you to think about, what about um, BYOD, right? So bring your own device. So. Here's a here's an actual real life situation that I got to see. You have this technically aptitude, you know, you have somebody with some technical aptitude who wanted to impress some ladies. And so he brings in a wireless access point and sets that wireless access point up within a building that is not supposed to have any kind of wireless network and then passes out that that password to some of those young women and says, hey, if you all need anything, this is already connected to the network, so you can walk around with your cell phone, you can head into the bathroom, and you can use the bathroom and use your phone, you can surf Facebook, you can do anything. Uh, I've even already got this set up with a um, VPN on it, so when you connect to it, it'll just send your traffic out so that we can bypass all the security internally. And so therefore, here's everything that you need. And then that was running web. So uh, is that OK? Is it not OK? Should that person have been doing that? Now, if you think that your network doesn't have a wireless network, and then you come in one day to work and you find out that there's a rogue access point located internally, but you had never prepared for that, what's, what's your behavior there, right? So people have turned your network wireless and that's an actual thing that actually happened. Like there is a place that that exact story occurred and they had never been prepared for it to be a wireless network. And I was literally telling that story and then I find out that in the front row of my talk, the guy who was tangentially involved in that situation was there and he was like, yeah, it really caught us by surprise. So, um, so your question essentially was, which one's more secure? Neither. They're, you have to treat them the same. And you have, to, you have to react differently, 
but the treatment that you give has to be the same. And you have to also expect that just because you're under the impression that you're running one type of network, that may not be the case. Um, and we'll get to that because we're going to also talk about like how to detect uh, rogue Wi-Fi access points within a building, uh, how to do some of that measurement to find out what's going on internal to your network. We'll talk about SSIDs and all this other stuff. But um, there really is no good answer. And anybody who tells you, well, a wired connection is always more secure, that's going to be the first person that's going to find out that somebody set up a wireless network on their network using their wired connection. So did that help? Did I answer some of that? Yeah, some of it. Yeah. Some of it. Okay. Yeah. Enough, for, enough of it for me to be satisfied with the answer. Okay. <laughs> so Wi-Fi itself began as an 11 megabit per second method for networking devices. Uh, today we're now seeing uh, multi-gigabit multi speeds, which is a far cry much faster than it was when this first came out. And each iteration has brought about numerous changes and gradual increases in performance. So let's talk about 802.11b first. 802.11b uh, 802 transmits at 2.4 gigahertz and moves data at 11 megabits per second. And it was released at the same time as Amendment A, but 2.4 gigahertz easily experiences interference. You can interfere with 2.4 very easily. 802.11a uh, transmits data at 5 gigahertz. It transmits at a maximum of 50 megabits per second. It uses OFDM or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing to enhance reception by dividing the radio signals into smaller signals before reaching the router, which I think is interesting because we cut the signals up and we made them smaller as far as packets are concerned, but now today we're actually starting to push them together into larger packets again. So um, we've kind of moved back and forth between deciding whether or not it's better to send lots of little packets or uh, less but larger chunks. 802.11g uh, transmits at 2.4 gigahertz and moves data at 50 megabits per second. Also uses OFDM technology. And if you notice, this was at 5 gigahertz at 54. This one's at 2.4 gigahertz at 54. 802.11n uh, transmits at 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. It moves data at 140 megabits per second. And it has a maximum theoretical speed of 300 megabits per second, perhaps uh, 450 with MIMO. Transmits uh, 802.11 AC transmits at a theoretical maximum of several gigabits per second and works exclusively in the 5 gigahertz band. It uses beam forming and focuses transmission of signals directly at devices. It supports uh, multi-user MIMO to increase throughput of devices and allows several devices to communicate at roughly the same time. Uh, so let's get into just some items on Wi-Fi security. WEP, uh, Wired Equivalent Privacy. It was released in 1997 and is completely broken. You should not be using WEP. Uh, in addition to that, if you have any devices that support WEP still, uh, they are probably extremely old and probably need to be upgraded. Most stuff nowadays, when you try to deploy it, will not even provide WEP as an option. Um, If necessary, try to either upgrade and get away from web, do whatever you got to take, but stay away from it, OK? Uh, WPA TKIP and WPA2 AES. Uh, WP or WP TKIP was an intermediate fix. Uh, it was only used while they were working towards WPA2. And TKIP is considered fairly vulnerable and should be avoided or turned off. Uh, as of this writing, you should be using WPA2 AES as this is considered the most secure method of security. Now, of interest in checking routers, uh, I still see, like with my router that was issued from my ISP, they still support WPA TKIP. Um, and I literally can't turn that off. So even though TKIP is something to be avoided, uh, I have a relatively, quote unquote, modern, new issue that has been provided, yes. So I know some routers also have AES plus TP, TK IP. Uh -huh. So is it just sending out both of those as an option, or is it using both? So it allows either one to connect. So whatever one your device offers is the one that it's going to use. 
So uh, theoretically, if your device is modern, your device should be using WPA2 AES, and therefore the TKIP shouldn't be used, but you really oughtn't offer it. Uh, you know, least privilege, right? Why, why allow somebody to connect in an in a insecure manner if we don't want them to? Uh, let's very quickly go over Wi-Fi channels. So US routers, and this is US specific, uh, this information would be different if you're out in Europe. Uh, US routers have 11 channels at 2.4 gigahertz and 45 channels for the 5 gigahertz networks. Adjacent channel interference occurs when devices from overlapping channels broadcast over each other and the 4 gigahertz spectrum has three channels that do not technically overlap and those channels are 1, 6, and 11. Now, channels are very important to understand because if you have ever uh, set at home and opened up your list of Wi-Fi networks that are in your neighborhood and you have seen that thing just absolutely be blasted with wireless networks in the neighborhood, um, that means that there's a very good chance that there is certain behaviors going on uh, where you are potentially going to be experiencing reduced speed because of what is going on with your neighbors. Uh, in addition to that, like for me, I have a PlayStation 4 and I have literally been sitting there and watching a television show and my PlayStation 4 has caught somebody else's controller in our neighborhood and I have had stuff backed out. Like I have left applications on our PS4 from it catching some kind of signal. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but things like uh, YouTube, I've had that get back out, and I've also had my TV turn off before, which I thought was interesting. Yes? Yeah. So, side story to that, uh, I had a gentleman that I worked with when I was younger, and what he liked to do was he used Squid Taxi in combination with an open wireless network. He had essentially um, locked down and called it free news. And so you could connect to his open wireless network and you could go to a bunch of different news sites. But using Squid Proxy, what he did was he would take the web page, he would change the web page based on words, and then you would get ridiculous stories, kind of like a Mad Lib. And then, but it looked like it was coming from the actual news network. And he would leave that up and leave it open for people to connect to. And essentially, when you connected to that wireless uh, device, it would immediately send you to, I want to say it was CNN. And then every story, everything that was in there, depending on what words were in there, it would fire off on Squid and completely change it. And uh, he found that to be very humorous. But I would also warn you all right now, uh, be very careful leaving your stuff open, uh, especially nowadays, because if you're, if somebody were to use your wireless network in order to conduct illegal activity, and that gets picked up, AKA if somebody decides that they're going to share child pornography using your wireless network, it's going to be your door that ends up with somebody kicking in uh, the door. Okay, they're not going to wait to find out whether or not that device is being pirated or used by somebody else or something like that. They show up on your doorstep, okay, uh, wherever that device is. That's very important to keep in mind. Um, if you all remember Tor and being in an exit uh, for Tor, um, if you were an exit node and you could actually jump, dump out into the internet, a lot of folks who are running Tor exit nodes ended up getting raided. Uh, both here within the United States as well as overseas because of the fact that essentially law enforcement only sees that exit node IP address and then they come sniffing there. They don't know that that system is being used um, as part of the Tor network. So something to keep in mind. Uh, let's talk about packet aggregation for a second. If it is using 801.11 AC, it is mandatory. And the concept of packet aggregation is simple. You send two or more data frames in a single transmission. This reduction of overhead is performance. And this reduction of overhead of sending, uh, this reduces the overhead of sending all packets that could reduce performance. So as we discussed further up, uh, the idea was to cut up all the packets into little tiny chunks and then send out lots of them. And then what we discovered was 
over time, well, now we want to aggregate those packets into larger chunks that are sent out. So technology, right? Wi-Fi SSIDs. Should I hide my Wi-Fi SSID? And the follow-up question to that is, what is an SSID? So again, uh, an SSID or service set identifier is the beacon that informs individuals in the area that a wireless network exists and can be connected to. Again, if you go down to the corner of your screen and you click on your wireless uh, network device and it comes up with a list of uh, networks and you see stuff like FBI party van and whatever else is going on in your neighborhood, uh, that would be your SSIDs. Now you can make those hidden. Does that matter? Uh, I am of the opinion that no, hiding the SSID does not matter. And there's a reason why I feel that way and we will uh, go over that here shortly. The, if you believe that hiding your SSID provides security, it does not. It provides obscurity. In addition to that, one of the reasons why I would recommend to people to hide their SSIDs on the flip side to this is um, it can potentially clean up your wireless network list a little bit. Um, I think that it's part of being a good neighbor, just on a personal opinion level, but uh, on a security level, it means nothing because we can, and I will demonstrate how you can do this here shortly, uh, we can actually find those hidden SSIDs uh, within our neighborhood, and so we can reveal them as well. So if you're willing to search and you're willing to look, uh, you can actually find this. So does not provide security. What it does do is it provides uh, politeness, in my opinion. There's no reason to make noise if you don't really need to. So are there multiple methods by which you can decloak or locate a hidden Wi-Fi network? Absolutely. Uh, it's a trivial action, and so um, that drops us right into Aircrack NG. I have links if you feel uh, the need to follow along, but Aircrack NG is a complete suite of tools to assess Wi-Fi network security. Uh, Aircrack NG provides monitoring, attacking, testing, and cracking tools. Um, it also provides the tools necessary to put your wireless cards into monitor mode using airmon-ng command. Uh, I find that Aircrack NG is a fantastic tool, and what you'll also notice is that some of the tools that I discuss, um, it uses Aircrack NG as the base for that tool. So there are scripts, essentially, that people have written uh, that will make it much easier for you to inc interact with Aircrack. But the true reality is, is that many of these tools that we're going to use are simply referencing Aircrack NG and using Aircrack NG to accomplish the mission uh, while putting a little bit of frosting on top to make it a little bit more pretty. Uh, WPS. First of all, I'm going to tell you right now, you should probably not be using WPS. Okay, there is a tool called Pixie WPS, which I think is extremely interesting. Uh, when we look at WPS, and if you're not familiar with WPS, let me break down what WPS is first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the mathematics of WPS, and then we're going to talk about Pixie, and then we're going to also have to drop into talking about Kali. So, starting with that, uh, WPS is that button that's on the front of your router that you press and then that allows you to connect to the device and uh, essentially inform your router that you want to pair a device to your router. Okay, WPS is supposed to be a method for simplifying and um, adding convenience to quickly add devices to your network. You should not enable and you should not allow and you should not use WPS. The reason why is because the way that WPS is written, uh, there are only approximately 11,000 combinations necessary for you to get the correct code, okay? Um, what they have discovered is that while there is supposed to be an extremely large number that takes a ton of time and so on and so forth, and it's supposed to be cryptolog um, cryptographically secure, well, it wasn't. Uh, essentially, you have 11,000 combinations at any time necessary in order for you to break WPS. So that goes to Pixie WPS, right? Um, Pixie WPS can defeat WPS in literally seconds, like 11 seconds 
ish, you can break WPS. For competitive tools like Reaver, which we're using an older type of attack, and that older attack uh, took hours. So you could set Reaver loose, and Reaver would attack against WPS, and it would take four to eight hours or whatever it was uh, in order to accomplish that attack. However, Pixie, um, Pixie, they were able to figure out that you could do it in essentially 11 seconds by attacking the 11,000 combinations necessary to actually break the system. Now, what's very interesting about Pixie WPS is that that's actually a tool that was born from collaboration on the Kali Linux forum. So Kali Linux has a web forum and you can go there and you can communicate with each other. There was an individual who um, discovered the mathematics. Uh, they communicated with somebody else. It became a team effort. And then over time, that um, community of users for Kali Linux ended up developing and building uh, the Pixie Dust attack and then Pixie WPS. So that's kind of the open source mentality in action, right? People come together, they do security research as a team, they uh, discuss and share ideas, and then at the end of the day, you build something that's better and greater than you know, the individual pieces. So I think that it's actually a very, very good success story for Cali in that um, I think a lot of people, I'll hit you in just a second, um, what I think a lot of people like to do is they like to get up and they say that Linux is less secure or Linux is this or Linux is that when comparing it to like a closed source community. Uh, the reason why I disagree with that is because being able to share and collaborate and, and build a community of people who can actually like look at the code, discuss the code, and put things together, uh, I think that's a much more effective use of time than trusting a handful of people in order to develop something. And now this also goes back to, and I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again, uh, show of hands, who here has looked at every piece and every line of code in the Linux kernel? None of us, right? Right. Now the hope is, is that somebody has looked at it, but the truth of the matter is there are still places within the, the, the Linux kernel that have not probably been you know, eyes on from enough people, okay? Uh, but that's the whole point of that community engagement. It's getting people to share ideas and discuss. So I, again, I think it's a huge win when you have a bunch of people who can come together and find something and then come out and say, hey, we have realized that there is a problem here. It's a vulnerability. It needs to be fixed. And if it can't be fixed, we have to mitigate it in some way. Your question. Um, at one point I was trying to do stuff with WPS, uh -huh. and in Reaver's case, it, yes, taking hours, but they, most manufacturers these days put a limit on how many attempts you can do for WPS. Mm -hmm. So doing a brute force with Reaver is not as likely to be done these days as a result. Possible for some, maybe, but not as likely. But to that, since that was my experience with it, are you familiar with what uh, Pixie WPS does, and if a, uh, a lockout after three attempts would be a similar issue with uh, Pixie WPS? You know, that's a good question. Um, off of people who were using it online, I didn't see any report of that. But also, I guess you would also have to think about the fact that as they mitigate problems at the manufacturer level, obviously tools and stuff like that are going to change. So I didn't see any mention of anybody having that problem. I know for a fact that my router, the one that's provided by my ISP, would be weak to this. Like, and that's, again, that's something that's issued straight from my internet service provider and was only given to us maybe three and a half, four years ago. And that's still vulnerable. And I would be highly surprised to hear that they have since upgraded those routers. So. I'm glad that you asked that question because that kind of segues into another point. Um, the vast majority of the, your people who are going to be vulnerable from this stuff, they're using stuff that's been issued to them, right? Like if I go to, um, I don't know, Roadrunner, like my, let's say my internet service provider is Roadrunner, and I go to them and I say, hey, uh, I want to buy my 
cable modem or whatever, give me all my stuff and I want to get set up, they're just going to give you what they issue, right? Most people are not going to sit down and say, hey, does this run tomato? Or hey, like, what, what's already on this system? Or, you know, blah, 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 right? Et cetera, et cetera. So you have this situation where people are only going to be using what they're issued. I can go through and probably, if I find a vulnerability in a CenturyLink router, I could probably hit everybody in my neighborhood because that's what we have. We have CenturyLink and that's what everybody has because that's pretty much the only internet service provider and so I know what box every single person there is using and if you, uh, that's just kind of how it is, right, throughout the nation. Uh, you only have certain providers, they only issue certain gear and unless you go in and you make purposeful changes, you're kind of screwed. And then in addition to that, because for many of us, those routers have to be on the edge of our network because they are, they double as our, as our um, connection device, our modem or whatever. So then we are in a situation where like for me, I have my router and then I run a wire from that router to a router, uh, a net gear that essentially works like a DMZ zone, uh, it's running a custom ROM, it has a whole bunch of other stuff attached to it, and then everything else connects to that, and then it goes out. So most people are not going to do that, right? Uh, I don't know if it really answers your question, but I think it kind of moves us forward within the topic in that um, I wouldn't even worry about being locked out right now because depending on what neighborhoods I go to and who's still having, who's still using older gear, most of those people are probably still vulnerable to this. And probably the rest of the country is probably still vulnerable to this on account of the fact of, has anybody here actually had their internet service provider come to them to upgrade their router or modem? Like, even though it's working? They made, buy a new one. They made you buy a new one? Yeah. Okay, after how long, can I ask? Every five years or so. Okay. Uh, I, they didn't make me, though. I just I called it for issues. I said, oh, it's old. Oh, okay. So it kind of depends on if you're checking out a problem. Sure. So for the vast majority of people, like, I, we don't, I almost never interact with my ISP. Like, the less I can speak to them, the better. And I still have the equipment that they issued from the very beginning. And I know that I, last time I was at my mom's house, I think that her equipment had been issued maybe like six, seven years ago. And I can't imagine, like, cause she never talks to him. She never, nobody ever comes by the house. There's nothing, I mean, her stuff works. They leave you alone, right? Yeah, it's not really a good communication method backwards. Right, yeah. So, uh, I don't know if Pixie can be stopped, but the flip side to that is, I think that right now a lot of people don't have that problem because how quickly do those, devices get issued and how quickly do we get people upgraded to the newest firmware, right? So uh, Kismet Wireless. Kismet is a wireless network and device detector, sniffer, war driving tool, and in addition to that is a wireless intrusion detection framework, which I think is extremely interesting. Uh, is anybody here running a wireless intrusion detection system? Yeah, awesome. Like for home or for work? Home, okay, awesome, good. Well, a network intrusion. System. So, an all around thing. An all around thing, okay. But not necessarily Kismet. Like, you're not specifically just looking for wireless devices. So, sure, kind of. Okay. So, let's jump into finding a hidden SSI. If we're going to use Aircrack NG, obviously we're going to run Pac Man, right? Because we're all running Arch. Yeah? Three. Okay. <laughs> So, sudo pacman switch s aircrack ng, and that gives us our application. Uh, you might be able to do it with app git. Uh, I don't know if emerge, I don't know if you can just emerge aircrack ng. We're, everybody's dual booting Arch and Gentoo, right? That's where we're at. Uh, there, sudo airmon ng start wlan0. What are we doing there? We're taking wlan0, which is this network card, and we're putting it into monitor mode. Uh, upon entering monitor mode, we do sudo air dump ng mon0 because mon0 is going to be the name of our um, wireless device that is in monitor mode. And then what we can do is sudo air dump 
ng uh, switch C1 and then the BSS ID. And then from there, we can do sudo error replay ng dash 0 15 dash C client BSS ID. And, and what I'm really doing here is I am looking for a wireless network that will essentially be hidden. So we won't have the name of it. But what we will do is we'll have the BSS ID. And I go and I find a device that is connected to that system. And then I send it a disconnect. And I say, hey, disconnect from that device. And so it does. And then after a few seconds, it will actually say, hey, is device such and such here? And that SSID will say, yeah, I'm here. And I can actually capture that traffic. And now I know the name of the SSID because it has to be broadcasted for that connection to be made. So all I'm doing is I'm taking somebody's connection and I'm disconnecting them, waiting for them to reconnect, and then I'm listening for that reconnect. That's the, that's the entire behavior here. So we have found your hidden Wi-Fi, and now I want access to it. Now I can sit down, and I can run Aircrack, and I can go get myself a dictionary. And if we go to GitHub right now, theoretically, I could go to, uh, let's see, actually, this one right here. I like this one. These are all WPA length passwords. So all of these are between 8 and 40 characters. They meet all of the, the um, uh, everything that you need for it to, to be a WPA password, OK? And so we have a dictionary. So we can sit here, and we can try to brute force into a network. And there's absolutely no reason why you can't sit there for the next 8 to 16 hours or longer and try to get in. But uh, there's actually a tool called Wi-Fi Fisher. And Wi-Fi Fisher is a method by which you can force somebody to disconnect from a network and then work in a man in the middle mode where you actually accept their connection and then forward them onto a page that says that they need to do a flash update, that they need to download something. Uh, yes? I was going to say along those lines, uh, more, I guess, speedy way to do things is send DOF packets, mm -hmm. Wireshark, the handshake, take the hash back and run it through Hashcat. Yeah, you can do that too. There's a, uh, that's a, that's actually a really good idea. Uh, but with this one, if we, if we just want to see if we can get them to give us our password, I think that this is actually a really good one for um, things like cons, right? So if you have a bunch of people who are connecting to a wireless network and you don't necessarily have access to that wireless network and you do want access to it, this may be a way of getting somebody who is potentially um, more apt to feel that they need to do something. Like you probably aren't. Probably not a good idea to run something like this on somebody's home network, right? Um, because it's going to be an outside or odd behavior to them, and they may notice that. And f it could make somebody feel uncomfortable. But if I'm um, dealing with somebody connecting to maybe a private wireless network at a school or something similar, this may be a, a, a functional way to get them to give us their password. Because we can say, Essentially, what it does is it creates a page. And when they connect, it forwards them to that page. And it says, this router is attempting to do a firmware upgrade. Please insert the password for the wireless network. And then when they type in that wireless network, it sends them to an endless loop. But it dumps the wireless password to your screen. So then you have access to the wireless network. And that person will need to disconnect and reconnect, or you turn it off, and you eventually allow them their connection. Uh, the other neat thing is, is it can also be used to uh, deliver a malicious payload. So if you were able to get them to be forced to a page and you knew that there was a vulnerability that you could abuse, this would be a way of um, delivering that vulnerability. So Wi-Fi Fisher is interesting because it is not available through 
your normal package method with Pac-Man, you actually have to use the AUR, so it's yay switch s Wi-Fi Fisher, and then sudo Wi-Fi Fisher dash i, and then your URL LAN one. Um, if you can use command prompt and you know how to use sudo, Wi-Fi Fisher is very easy to use. Takes nothing. Okay. Uh, literally, it comes up and you walk through it. It has you pick a wireless network, so on and so forth. And then at the end, it essentially does the attack for you. Uh, wi fi and attacking Wi-Fi, or I'm sorry, attacking WPS with wi fi uh, Again, I have links that will take you uh, to other web pages if you're so interested on how to use wi fi Really, all you need to do is put your device into monitor mode, choose a target, and wait. And Wi Fi will attempt to break into that wireless network. Uh, I think that Aircrack NG and something more targeted, though, is probably better and a little bit faster. Um, but, or if it's WPS, I recommend Pixie. So, if you're attacking WPA2 using Wi Fi, it's as simple as Wi Fi, switch Mac. Uh, what this does is it varies your MAC address so that you don't get uh, essentially banned from the device. So that may actually be something that is available in Pixie. So <clears throat> essentially you look like a brand new device every time that you're connecting. Have you ever experimented with that? Did you test to see if that worked during your... Changing your MAC address? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't try that. Okay. Uh, I would be interested in knowing with the new, more modern setups, if that's part of it, because that's a, a, it's a good way to avoid getting banned when trying to connect to those devices. So again, going back to Wi-Fi, it's Wi-Fi, switch Mac, switch Aircrack. Why? Because we're using Aircrack. So essentially, Wi-Fi is going to pretty up the method by which you use Aircrack. Uh, we set a dictionary, so we have our list, and then we cut it loose, and it, it starts the attack. Uh, wireless intrusion detection with Kismet. So Kismet provides a method by which you can detect rogue wireless access points, monitor your local area, and alert. Um, so I'm going to treat this a little bit like how I do with my government customers, but I'm going to treat you all like that. So let me ask you something. Think about where you work, and if I were to create a 20-foot zone of exclusion where no wireless devices work within 20 feet, of that area, would that have an adverse effect or could that have an adverse effect on where you work or what you do? Maybe. I've got 20 feet where I can just make nothing work. For some of us, no, but there are certain people that I've worked with that a 20 feet area where certain stuff doesn't work could cause them quite a bit of problems. Um, what's that? That's a skiff room. It, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's 20 feet or not. But there, yeah, absolutely. There are rooms that are specifically set up that way. Uh, you're not supposed to have radios. You're not supposed to have any kind of devices that people could use for communication. Yeah, absolutely. So there are places where this is done on purpose. But there are also places where, um, and I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names and I'm not going to point fingers, but there are places where, uh, disrupting their ability to use Wi-Fi and to use any kind of wireless communication with that area could cause quite a bit of problems. So why do I bring this up? Before we get into wireless intrusion detection systems, if you are in a situation where you are a business, where you are a government entity, where you are anything, in the event that somebody decides to use some of these techniques against you, um, and you can't figure out where they're doing it from or what is happening, you have some options available to you. Uh, when I asked the question, who do you contact, a whole bunch of people raised their hands previously and they said the FCC. And I was like, yeah, like all three of them. Like who there is going to show up, right? Uh, and if you've ever tried to get a hold of the FCC, it can actually be pretty difficult. Uh, there are plenty of, pri plenty of pirate radio stations that still operate here within the United States on a regular basis. Like, that's just how it is, right? So um, the truth of the matter is, if you are in a situation where you need assistance, two major, um, ass two major players that could potentially assist you are your ham radio operators. So you have CERT and your CERT teams. 
and then you have Mars. And Mars would probably be easier to get a hold of and get operating if you worked for a government entity, but your CERT team, uh, they should be able to work with your security team locally and actually get people out to do what's called fox hunting, and they can look for devices and things like that that are causing problems. Um, we have a very, very, very good um, ham radio community out here within Arizona, and particularly like within the Phoenix area, the Queen Creek area. Um, if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you have no interest in ham radio, I totally understand, but if you have an interest in Wi-Fi, if you have an interest in any of this other stuff, uh, familiarizing yourself with ham radio is a huge bonus. And in addition to that, this is probably one of the best areas that you could be in uh, living-wise if you want to actually interact with those people. Because we have a very extensive repeater system out here. We have tons of people communicating on a regular basis, a lot of mobile operators. Uh, it is actually super fascinating, the sheer number of users of ham radio out here in this area. So, do I recommend having some kind of wireless intrusion detection system alongside your network intrusion detection system? Yes. Um, I know you mentioned that you have a network intrusion detection system uh, that you're running internal, but that also does not assist with my assumption being that it doesn't assist with actually identifying the actual physical devices if they're broadcasting in your area. Um, you have the, essentially you're waiting until something connects to your network, right? And so if something connects to the network, then you would detect it once it's in, but you wouldn't have any ability to know whether or not they were conducting an attack? Uh, I mean, essentially within a couple packets, like something there. Okay. Oh, okay, so you're running a white list and everything else. Okay, perfect. Uh, not everybody does that, and sadly, not everybody in government is running like a white list. Like you could, there are lots of places that you could go to, and if you ask them, hey, what devices connect to your network, they wouldn't be able to tell you. So, uh, it's very interesting that we kind of have this working group where we can come here and our like home wireless networks are more secure, better taken care of, better curated, and better monitored than like places where people are getting pay, paid six figures to sit there and that's essentially their job is to monitor a wireless network, but we do it for home stuff. It's, yeah, it's very interesting just, especially with the people that I get to interact with on a, a regular basis. So, uh, being able to detect a rogue wireless access point, monitor your local area, and alert is extremely important. So if you don't have some kind of network intrusion detection system, uh, if you're not running whitelists, if you don't have methods for being able to know what's going on with your network, you really need to. Why do I bring this up? So another case story, right? Uh, a gentleman meets another man. Uh, that man states that he is a uh, network uh, guru. He can help him with his computer, so on and so forth. The guy says, oh, great. Super fantastic, very happy about that. Please come on over to my house. That guy goes over to the guy's house, helps him set up his computer, helps him set up everything, gets everything up and running, and then um, uses his computer and his wireless network in order to um, transfer child pornography. And so now he has a third party access point that he has access to to do illegal behavior um, anytime he wants. And this guy essentially went to several different locations all over the place, met a bunch of different people, and then set up their computers for them, set up their network, and then started using their network to traffic in illegal material. And so eventually, um, ICAC, the Internet Crimes Against Children group, they discovered that there was a whole bunch of people sharing illegal material, right? And so they contacted the authorities and they contacted law enforcement and they did all of the stuff necessary. And so doors got kicked in and people got arrested and all kinds of stuff happened. And these were all innocent people who were affected by that because they didn't know how to set up their own computer, didn't know how to take care of their own stuff. And what really ends up happening is somebody else comes in and does that stuff. And that's how you end up in the news, right?
So if you don't know how to take care of your computer and you don't know how to set up your network and you don't know whether or not somebody is using your network inappropriately, those are all very important things that you need to keep in mind because while that story sounds like, oh, that's kind of far-fetched, that could never happen to me, um, do you really know who's connected to your network? Um, case in point, uh, we have a babysitter and my wife has access to the wireless password. And so one day I come home and I go, hey, what device is blah, blah, blah? It was connected to our network. And she says, oh, I gave the babysitter the wireless password. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Very upset about this, very unhappy. Uh, I noticed, and so therefore I had to uh, disband that password and I had to assign a new password and I had to go through and reconnect all of our devices. And then what I did was I created a guest network with extra monitoring and with logging, so on and so forth. And then I kicked that one on uh, approximately an hour before the babysitter shows up, let her use it, and then it automatically turns off after a certain point in time when I know that she shouldn't be there. And then I keep logs. Now, is that going to protect me from getting my door kicked in? Maybe not. Somebody could potentially still show up if, if somebody's doing something untoward, but uh, at least now I have evidence that I can hand over and say, hey, this is who was connected, this is what they were doing from this time to this time, and here's my logs. So is it paranoid? Maybe. Does it mean that they're not out to get you? No. So uh, we talked a little bit about people avoiding or trying to get over roadblocks. Um, you can set your network up with lots of security and you can do all kinds of fancy fun things, but if somebody decides to set up that wireless access point or they decide to conduct themselves in a manner in which it's going to avoid your um, defenses, if they have even the slightest amount of computer savviness, uh, they will most likely be able to escape and get out and do stuff that they're not supposed to do. Like that's, it's a given. Uh, if you allow people to use computers, if they know how to use computers, they're going to be able to use the computer, okay? Um, in addition to that, with these skills, we talked a little bit about being able to de-auth people. That's a common method of uh, messing with people. So you don't have to go through the entire process of conducting an attack and gaining access to stuff. You could set up your Wi-Fi card and just send out de-auth packets over and over and over, and essentially denial of service in area. Uh, people do that at conventions. So um, it's one of the things that I also warn folks about. Yes, you're learning a skill here where you're learning a little bit about Wi-Fi hacking. We now kind of understand how Wi-Fi works. We have a, a little bit better idea about some of the security issues. And yes, we have the ability to de-auth people. Don't do that for fun. But also, that's an issue in terms of what if somebody were to set up a system to sit there and just repeatedly de-auth people from a network? So going back to your question, right? Which one's more secure, which one's less secure? Okay, so we set up a wireless network and we have a whole bunch of users who connect to that wireless network, whether it's on a BYOD policy or it's on a issued policy or it's just, I just, want to run cable, so every single computer is on a wireless network, right? So I take a Raspberry Pi and I add a battery to that Raspberry Pi and I have eight hours worth of service and I program that thing to run in monitor mode and to randomly send de-auth packets. It's not even as expensive. But What's that? that? Have you heard of an ESP8266? Uh, it's the a little micro controller. Uh -huh. You can actually run de-auth services off Just that. Just off of that? And it's one lithium ion 18650 and a, a little PCB about that big. Okay. I mean, the whole package is smaller than a Sega gun. So super cheap, super inexpensive. Um, so there you go. It's something even less expensive than a, a Raspberry Pi. But if I were to set something like that up, I can sit there and just de-auth people randomly. You could cause disruptions within a the network. You, there's all kinds of things that you can do, right? So let's talk a little bit about combat then, okay? And the reason why I bring this up is because what's happening overseas eventually makes its way back here. Uh, one of the concerns that I have and one of the things that I've discussed with our, um, with individuals 
involved in policing in like rural areas was a conversation that I saw online between people discussing how difficult would it be for me to do multi-spectral jamming. I want to just jam a whole bunch of different stuff all at once. I just want to jam it all, right? Because what I want to do is I want to lure a guy in, I want to jam all communications, and then I want to initiate an ambush. And you might be thinking, well, that sounds like far-fetched, so let's talk about South Africa for a second. Uh, there are backpack-sized multi-spectrum jammers that you can wear that will block pretty much all signals out for about a half a mile. And so out in South Africa, what they do is they wear one of those backpacks, and then they go to a farm, and then in the middle of the night, they go into the farm and they kill everybody within the farm. They shoot everybody, they rape, they do all kinds of terrible things, but to keep you from being able to communicate out and ask for help or get a hold of other farmers or anything like that, what they do is they have a backpack that uh, they use to protect themselves during that period of time so that they can conduct their attack. People have seen that. And so now they're asking, what if I got a sheriff? What if I've got somebody who's going to respond to one of these areas? I call them in. When they reach a certain point, I want all of their communications to stop, and then I'm going to attack them. Okay? So uh, what does that do for us? Well, we now know that this is a thing that can be done. Uh, we now know that people are looking into it and trying to discover what can I do with this? How can I do this? What are some of the tools that are available to me for doing this? Uh, and I want to go down here. One of those tools is actually called the Wave Bubble. And it's about the size of a pack of cigarettes. Uh, so Wave Bubble, they have instructions on how to build these online. Uh, this one obviously is about a 20 foot radius, which is where I came up with that question earlier. Uh, if I build a zone of exclusion of approximately 20 feet, how could that harm you? Well, if I have that in my pocket and I approach your vehicle or you approach me and you're a police officer with a radio and a cell phone and I initiate combat with you, if I'm within 20 foot uh, and you can't call out, you can't ask for help, how does that change your plans? What's, and, and this is a question that normally comes up within law enforcement. Uh, I don't know how many of you understand like the 20 foot rule, but there is an idea that at a certain level, uh, even if you have a firearm like on your hip, I can close a distance so quickly that you cannot draw your weapon before I am on you with a knife or I am on you with another weapon, okay? Like being able to close a specific distance is part of law enforcement training, okay? So if I've already shut down your ability to ask for help and we're standing enough to each other that I could potentially close that distance before you can draw your weapon and you're trying to fiddle with a radio and you're trying to figure out, hey, why didn't all my, nothing works right now. I can't get a hold of anybody. Nobody can hear me. What's happening here? Um, again, we're seeing it overseas. Anything that we see overseas could potentially show up here. It's a thing to keep in mind, okay? Uh, also with WIDS, we also need to understand that the problem with wireless intrusion detection systems that actually monitor outside of your network is that it requires time. So we need to be able to identify and fingerprint many vulnerabilities. So if I see certain items showing up over time and I know generally what my network is supposed to look like, I know my area of operations, when that area of operations change, that's when I should notice that there's a problem. Think about it as the bush, right? Um, if I have a zone that I have like a firing line on and I always know what that zone looks like, and one day I come outside and I sit down and I look and there's a giant bush and that bush wasn't there yesterday, but it's there today, that's a thing to notice, okay? That's the same way that your wireless intrusion detection system should be functional. You should keep historical data that you can go back and you can reference. 
devices like the, um, the wave bubble, again, we're not seeing them uh, very often here within the United States right now, but they are being deployed during the perpetration of violent crime overseas. Um, obviously, their jammers are much better. They're generally military grade. They can jam up to about a, a half a mile out. And uh, like I said, there's unconfirmed discussion about how to use these tools uh, in relation to conducting attacks on things like home invasions as well. Uh, you have to remember, what have we done as a society? We've moved away from having landlines. We've moved over to using cell phones almost exclusively. Um, most people will have a cell phone and they'll have that cell phone available to them. If that cell phone is jammed, they have now lost all communication with like 911 services, right? So you have people who are asking, okay, if I want to hit a house uh, for a drug rip, how do I turn off all the cell phones within that house so that they can't reach out? I don't want anybody to do anything until they hear the shooting start. Something to think about. Uh, let's discuss GNU radio for a moment. It is extremely inexpensive to get involved in learning about radio and RF and all of that uh, if you have access to Amazon. You can go to Amazon.com, you can buy yourself a little tiny um, USB radio receiver or transceiver, and then you can install GNU radio using Pac-Man, of course, right? We're all going to use Pac-Man. And then upon using GNU radio in conjunction with that, we can actually see the spectrum around us. Uh, again, it's very, um, it's very popular within the ham radio community. And so if you are interested in getting involved in radio, uh, you can get involved with your ham radio guys. And there are tons of them out here in this area, local to us, that actually experiment with this stuff all the time. I have a group of them who actually experiment using GNU radio out at a park. And I've seen them sit there and use uh, all SDR or software defined radio for their communication. Um, it's extremely fascinating, very interesting, and it's a very neat way of repurposing technology in order to allow us to communicate out and uh, works in emergencies, all kinds of stuff. It's very cool. I'm now going to introduce something called Wiggle. And Wiggle is very interesting. So I'm going to allow location access. And what Wiggle is, is Wiggle is a method by which you can uh, go here and you can actually find wireless networks. OK? And I'm going to let that sink in for a second. Because what you can do is you can sit somewhere and you can listen to people's devices as they ask, am I in range of blank network? And then you can actually go look for that network. Uh, now, there are collisions, of course. Uh, and you can sign up for this project if you're so interested in doing so. And you can actually see where all those wireless networks are being mapped here within the United States. Uh, in addition to that, you can take a look and see where wireless networks are being mapped in other countries and all over the different places. Antarctica is nothing. Yep, there's some that are listed as being in Antarctica. Isn't that interesting? Uh, polar bears. Yeah, polar bears got to have internet too. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, if you so this is this is to the side, but um, I want to make two statements about Antarctica. The first one is is I'm very disappointed that if you use Shodan and you look at Antarctica. Absolutely nobody has ever said or set up a network that's called like Stargate or like Space Alien Base Number One or Hollow Earth. Like I'm super disappointed in those people as scientists for not at least setting up a Raspberry Pi that reports like some kind of network that is fun. Like very angry with them. You all need to step it up. I know you're watching these videos. So somebody needs to go up there to their Antarctic base and fix that for me, please. OK? And then so the second item is uh, you can actually look at AQ, which is Antarctica, and uh, on Shodan. And you can take a look at all the networks and all the other stuff that's down there. And there are tons and tons of like military bases 
that show up um, with like DOD IP addresses and everything else comes back and it's all just down there. So you can literally see where they're, what they're doing down there on some of these continents that you would think that nobody are hanging out on except for scientists. And it's totally not true. Like there's all kinds of people down there. So we'll try approximately 600 million networks, reports on them using reporters who use like mobile devices and things like that in order to um, locate wireless networks. Uh, Wiggle also locates cellular towers, which is a completely different set of issues. Now, Russia is working on installing Pole 21 anti-missile jamming systems on various civilian cellular network towers. Let's think about that for a second. So, if you were to look at what's going on in Europe, uh, they take their civilian network cell phone towers, um, 5G, anyone? They have to be very dense, right? So you have 5G networks, so you have tons of these things all over the place. They have to be within line of sight of each other, so they're repurposing them as a tool that can also be used to block missiles. Uh, because our cruise missiles and things like that, to communicate with them, uh, they would rely on signals that could potentially be jammed by these systems. Okay, Something to keep in mind, right? Uh, here within the United States, um, there are tons of groups that have been discussing the feasibility of attacking critical infrastructure like communication towers. Okay, so we map out these communication towers and we know where they're located and we know how much they're worth. You can literally go in and you can look up a cellular tower and then find out how much is being paid on a monthly basis for that cellular tower. People trade that information because they trade contracts. And so you can buy and sell cellular tower contracts that would earn you money depending on where you live, but it also tells you the value of that tower based around how much your service providers are paying for access to that tower. So then you have a target list with a value list with a list of where everything is, plus in foreign countries we know that they're repurposing these tools for part of their defense network. So there's so many things going on with um, wireless networks, with cell phone towers, with everything else, that it's something to, that's very important for you to keep in mind, especially because of the fact that a lot of these in your backyard. Now, I know, um, I thought it was very interesting, so I don't know if you all remember, but for a while when 5G was first getting pushed out here to the United States, like we're super behind on the internet. We all know that, right? Uh, if you don't know that, if you're watching this and you don't know that, know this. Here's a topic that you also need to know. Here within the United States, our infrastructure is extremely outdated. We have countries like Korea, South Korea, uh, that have like magnificent internet that just allows people to just transfer internet, transfer items over the internet at incredible speeds within their country. Uh, their internet is very robust. They use it for all kinds of communication tools. Um, it's just a magnificent thing that here within the United States we really don't have. Our internet is kind of crumbling when you really think about it and our communication is kind of crumbling. So that whole push for 5G was a really big deal within the United States. It was supposed to increase our cell um, communication, make our cell phones faster, all this other stuff, right? And so what we ended up having was a whole bunch of foreign nations that actually got up and ran like this disinformation campaign on how um, essentially 5G like kills you and it makes your brain boil and you get autism and all kinds of like terrible things happen because of 5G. And they ran that campaign for a while in the hopes that here within the United States, people would start fighting against having the 5G towers set up. And if they could convince us to shut down those 5G towers, that reduces our ability to communicate and move information. Uh, systems like Pole 21 that are being used in Russia, uh, those become things that would be much more difficult for us to be able to uh, implement here if necessary. There's just a whole bunch of like pieces that all hinge on countries who want a strategic advantage against the United States, they really need us to have crappy infrastructure. Like, it's helpful. If you don't like us, then making sure that our infrastructure is failing is a positive thing to them, okay? Um, and it sounds like, oh yeah, that's like a simple idea, but I think a lot of people don't think about that. They don't think about the fact that something as simple as like cellular towers that's critical infrastructure. It's ways of communication, right? Uh, if I can't pick up my phone and I can't call the police and ask for help, that's a problem. Uh, 
they don't want you to be able to do that. So going back to Wiggle, going back to these tools, uh, Wiggle can be used for other stuff too. I usually have a much longer piece to Wiggle because you can use it for investigation as well. Uh, I leave that up to you all if you want to research that. But uh, being able to go in and look at what's going on with wireless networks all over the world, it gives you a lot of information. We've talked about it here before previously. It's metadata, right? It's the information that surrounds things that gives us more information about what's really going on in a location. Uh, I leave it at that. So let's get into our answers. Wiggle is a site that can be used for locating wireless networks. Hey, look at that. Aircrack NG can be used to crack wireless networks. Wi-Fi normally functions on 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. Normally. <coughs> Again, there are proprietary systems that uh, work on different wireless um, frequencies. Wi-Fi Fisher, the rogue access point, is a tool that can be used for phishing Wi-Fi passwords. So securing your network, it goes beyond detecting attacks. A good network engineer knows what devices are authorized, white lists and things like that, uh, where they are located and what they should be doing. Wi-Fi removes boundaries, and with the advent of bring your own device culture, it's becoming increasingly difficult for admins to know what is or is not on their network. Uh, finding a hidden SSID is trivial. Basic computing tools can be used to defeat almost any obfuscation. And rogue access points, targeted attacks, and even phishing can be deployed to defeat most basic forms of securing a wireless network. It's trivial. It's literally a handful of commands, and we can start attacking Wi-Fi networks. It takes nothing. And if you can follow like a Chinese food menu and you can ask for a number, you can conduct these attacks because it's the exact same thing. You sit there, you run an application, and you press one, two, three, four until you're done. You must consider implementing a wireless intrusion detection system, and you must treat your wireless networks as potentially vulnerable at all times. In addition, you should consider deeply how a Wi-Fi can reveal additional metadata about a building, a person, or a surrounding area. Looking for Wi-Fi and other wireless signals can reveal tremendous amounts of information about an area and the activities being conducted there. SIGSEC, or Signal Security Matters. Uh, I bring up the term SIGSEC because if you go to Google and you type in SIGSEC, there's not a whole lot of information about it. Uh, but it is an actual term. And there are entire military groups that are dedicated to signal security and how to secure your wireless networks, how to secure any communication that's going over um, wireless networks. But again, there's not a lot of data about it. It's, there's not a lot of discussion about what we need to be concerned about. Uh, if you all remember a couple of years back, uh, the Fitbit, and the Fitbit was a GPS system that essentially mapped out uh, where people were running, right? And so what did we see within our military? A whole lot of people within the military community were wearing Fitbits, and what did they do? They went for jogs around their super secret, top secret bases all over the Middle East and all over Africa, and they essentially mapped out the entire base. And so if you went to the Fitbit webpage and you looked at where people were having good runs, and you looked in the Middle East, what did you find? You found US users with their accounts linked to their Fitbits, revealing GPS coordinates for all of our most top secret locations in those areas. <coughs> that's a security issue, right? That's a problem. And that's using wireless communications, and it's using uh, GPS, and it's using all of these tools that allow people to map out what's going on in an area, OK? So what are my final recommendations? Choose. Nix. It can be Unix, Linux, whatever, but you need to start picking your operating system and you need to take personal responsibility for your security. Um, you, you really can't be passive anymore. Um, take a look at the news, right? We know about what was said by Edward Snowden. We know about all the different information that's been leaked. We are aware of what's going on in this world, right? You're going to to take an active role in defending yourself. Uh, securing your network and monitoring local traffic. It sounds like a really basic thing. Most of us within this room, we probably already do that. But for the people who are going to be watching this on YouTube, a lot of you are learning about these topics because they're introductory level. 
and you might not be thinking about it, but if you don't know what devices are connected to your network, that could potentially be a problem. If you don't know who has access to your network, if you are only running a single network, therefore you don't have any of uh, the ability to uh, separate your traffic versus other people's traffic. So running things like a guest network and stuff like that, that's very important. Um, it protects you and it also helps protect you in the event that you have to go to court or something similar. It's about setting yourself up for that full spectrum defense, right? Not only were we worried about bad guys and hackers and stuff like that, but what if we do end up in a legal situation? Can we bring the information necessary to vindicate ourselves? Uh, regularly review your tools like Wiggle for changes in your local area. Uh, if you don't know what's going on around you, you will be caught unawares. So take a look, see what's on Wiggle, see what's on these different tools, find out what's in your area, find out who's operating in different areas. Can that information be um, uh, spoofed? Absolutely it can. There are ways that we could funnel and feed bad information into that system, but the idea is that you should use it as part of your repertoire especially if you're an investigator or something like that. It's a lot of really good information on there. Uh, develop your equipment and your gear. If you're not setting yourself up for success, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, find the tools that work for you. If you have money, get yourself a pineapple. Uh, get a hack RF. Get any of these tools. If you don't, build your own. There's instructions online. Uh, the more intelligent you become and the more familiar with your tools, the more effective you become and also the more that you are able to do with less. Uh, it's very similar to like a survival situation. If you look at the world's greatest survival situation type of people, and when I have interacted with some of these like serious snake eaters, these are not guys who go out and spend tens of thousands of dollars on gear. These are guys who go out into the desert and flip flops. And they just hang out out there for days at a time and are able to survive because they know what tools are out there, they know how to do it. It's the exact same thing here. Learn how to use your equipment, learn how to use your tools. And then finally, choose freedom. I know that I'm the man, you know, I have a badge on my chest and all that other stuff. I'm a person that people usually look at and go, mm, I don't know if I can trust this guy, but I'm a big proponent of the United States, of freedom, of taking care of yourself, and if you're not doing wrong, then you should be safe and secure in yourself and in your home, right? Uh, and then once you start doing wrong, that's when you become my problem. So uh, choose freedom. Choose, choose your operating system correctly. Choose your computer correctly. Uh, do the things necessary to defend yourself, to defend your family, and to pay attention. And one of the best and most important things you can do is start by educating yourself. And so with that said, I wanna thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I know it's late. I know it's rainy, and so I um, really appreciate you all taking the time to be out here with me on, on your Thursday night. So thank you very much.